but first of all, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Dabauer for his presentation. Lucas, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for the introduction words. Um, happy to welcome you to the um, simulation conference. So my topic today is technology, technology advances, assisting simulation training in medicine. A quick introduction to myself, to my person. I'm originally a physician. I'm the head of the simulation center in AMC. We are one of the probably most active or for sure one of the most active simulation centers in, in Europe. Um, originally trained and board certified in anesthesia, intensive care, emergency medicine, family medicine. I'm doing simulation for quite a while, but got the severe um, infection with the simulation virus in 2008 when we intensively started doing simulation. I'm also a licensed executive advisor and in this function I've been working with more than 150 hospitals, universities, meanwhile in more than 50 different countries worldwide. I'm also a CESM, the European Society of Simulation um, meeting member um, focusing on the Sim Center accreditation stuff. And at least before COVID, I was a very frequent traveler, traveling more than 450,000 miles and having more than 140 international hotel nights. That's at least before COVID times. This year, I'm having more miles in the helicopter, which I'm still riding with as a physician than in the airplane. And a lot of uh, traveling collided with um, being a father of also three little kids. When we will have the discussion afterwards, and you see me looking like this in, the, in your computer, this is when I'm looking fully concentrated. So don't worry, this is not a sign. I don't like your question. This is how I look like when I'm fully concentrated. So we at AMC, we're an internationally active training and consulting company, and we are working with healthcare institutions in optimizing their treatment and also their education. As I said before, we are one of the most active ones. We're doing more than 300 trainings just with high fidelity simulators per year, and 90% of them are in situ, so on the workplace of the participants. I'll tell you more about it later. We're interdisciplinary, interprofessional, and multinational, and we train hospitals, emergency services, police, military, mainly in Austria and Germany. This is the stuff we are working with. Computers, mannequins, new ones, obstetrical ones, a little bit older ones, neonatal. But this is pretty much the stuff we are doing, working with a lot of um, mannequins and simulators uh, to train healthcare professionals out there. We are recording all this with um, video systems, we're training in gastroscopy, colonoscopy, laparoscopy, ultrasound, table-based exercises, and in the last years, also a lot of virtual reality and augmented reality. In the last years, we have been more and more active working with international simulation centers, the countries colored in blue are the countries we have been working with. We've been supporting simulation centers from ambulance services or from private universities, public universities, but also police and military and uh, the medical um, equipment industry. Resulting last years in more than 280 days working with other simulation centers only. What we are doing there is we try to work with them on a long-term basis, not just for a um, very short amount of time, but ideally on a long-term basis, developing their simulation centers, planning them, 
training them and having long-term uh, win-win situations being established. Therefore, we opened also our first subsidiary in China, official. Um, this is a picture from Shanghai. And we started our first subsidiary there in 2018. We have a couple of accreditations from simulation in corporations, but also from others. So European accreditation, ISO certification, a couple of Chinese accreditations, and all our certifications are um, CME certified. Uh, all our trainings are CME certified because we see so much out there, because we're so heavily involved in teaching, we are also working with the um, manufacturers of, of certain um, vendors, helping them to improve didactics, helping them to make it closer to the market needs and developing tools together with them. Sometimes it's alpha testing, sometimes it's beta testing, sometimes it's developing cases. That's... Um, enough on what we are doing. Coming back to our topic for today. <clears throat> we all know from our own experience, from our painful experiences, that a lesson taught is not necessarily a lesson learned. Most of us are teachers out there in whatever um, circumstances, and we think we are doing a great lecture, but on the next day, when we see our students on the ward, on the university, or in school again, we know um, that it's probably not been very effective. We all know, we also know that the most valuable lessons are not necessarily taught. They are experienced. We learn by actually doing something. And long, long time ago, when the world, in our opinion, looked like this, the European opinion looked like this, two very wise men said on a continent we haven't even discovered by then, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. That's been said by Confucius, at least to the Europeans. The Chinese say, it's one of the students from Confucius who said it. And that's been 2,500 years ago. And a friend of uh, Confucius lived a few years earlier. He said, knowledge is a treasure, but practice is the key to it. And a while ago, some thousand years later, in the year when, the, when we landed on the moon, or at least when the Americans said they landed on the moon, Another very wise person published an article called The Cone of Learning, and the person was called Edgar Dale. And he said something very important about how we learn and what is retaining in our brains a few years later, a few weeks later. And he said that if we read something, and this is meanwhile supported by a lot of other literature, um, after two weeks, by reading something, we remember 10% of what we read. When we hear something, it's 20% of what we hear after two weeks. If we see and hear something, if we watch a demo or a movie or look at a certain exhibit, it's 50%. This is passive learning. And as you see, it's probably very limited effect. And when we're giving a talk or when we manage to give our students the possibility to take part in a discussion together, it's 70% of what we say. And when we're doing something on our own, doing the real thing, treating a patient or simulating something, it's 90% of what we do will stay in our memory after two weeks. So, a few years later, this was um, adopted by a person called Kolb, and he called it the Kolbsche learning cycle. It starts in the top. Knowledge is first. Then we should acquire some technical skills, learn some algorithms, then train it as a team together, get different perspectives, and then, and then we should treat a patient or board a plane or board a train or doing whatever. 
I guess this is all pretty much obvious to you and probably you know it already. Medicine is there since the dawn of time. And in the last centuries, learning in medicine looked more like that. It's half of the culture learning cycle. We acquired some knowledge and then we go to the patient. We're learning from books and then learn from the patients. This has been the long tradition in the last centuries, pretty much everywhere around the world. In some fewer cases, we combine this with some technical skills and add the technical skills to the knowledge and then go to the patient. Most of the technical skills, especially in mid-Europe with a very traditional approach to anatomy, the technical skills were cadaver labs. In the American and British way and learning system, <coughs> especially in medicine, the credo for many, many years was see one, do one, teach one. And this lasted for a very, very long time. And I'm, I was studying in the US in the beginning of uh, the 2000s. And this is something I heard hundreds of times. See one, you see someone placing a chest tube, then you do one under supervision. And when you did this, you teach the procedure, you teach the placing of the chest tube to the next student already. As you can all imagine, this is combined with a lot of difficulties. And if you're looking at one of the places where some of us worked or work, see one, do one, teach one could have a quiet, dramatic outcome for the patient. It's a complex, it's a complicated environment. And this is something we probably all feel very familiar with as healthcare providers is with this kind of situation. You go to a patient, the patient said, hey doc, how often have you been doing this? And your answer is probably, oh, when you're honest, hopefully. Um, oh, actually you're my second patient or actually you're my first patient and uh, I haven't been doing this at all. And the question that comes into a lot of people's minds right now, and I guess that's why we are all sitting in a simulation conference because we have all the wish that this will be different in the future. Um, is this really ethical to the patient? Is this ethical to us as healthcare providers? Because it's not just the patient suffering from the bad treatment, it's also suffering for healthcare professionals who know that the patient could have survived or could have been treated much better if we have been trained appropriately. So the question is, is this really ethical? We all know it's not really ethical. And if you look at the challenges worldwide, and I had the pleasure or the um, honor to, to uh, learn a lot about all these different international experiences and, and problems, we all internationally have pretty much identical challenges. So the problems in Germany are the same than in the US, the problems in China are the same than in Australia, and probably Bulgaria wouldn't be a very big exception to this. And at least I've been visiting Sofia once doing some stuff with simulation people. I know it's not very different um, in Bulgaria as well. And the challenges internationally are, we all have a lack of teachers, there's not enough teachers, not in nursing, not in, in the medical fields, because they have to work on the patient. And there, we already don't have enough people. So we have a lack of teachers. And the trend for students is not being trained in big, huge auditoriums anymore. But the trend is towards training the students in very small groups, because it's, as we've seen before in the literature, it's much more effective. 
So this is a spiral, this is a gap that's really opening up a lot. And more and more universities come out there because we need more doctors, we need more nurses <clears throat> because of some epidemiological challenges. And these universities are fighting for students because some of them are private, some of them need to justify why they are out there. So they are fighting for students. And none of these universities or very few of these universities, very few of the hospitals really have enough money for good teaching, for, um, for allowing students a perfect training. We all complain of having empty pockets, which is making the problem even bigger. And this is a thing that's common or pretty much standard in all the countries, probably the least um, common or, or um, the, less, uh, the, the, the few problem in the US, but pretty much everywhere the hospital managers <clears throat> complain that when, we, when they get students in the last years or when they have um, doctors on the first day of their work or nurses on the first day of their work after graduating, they cannot really use us because we are not really well prepared for the duties um, we have to we have to accomplish in the in the hospital afterwards. This is also underlined by another study from the BMJ that came out a few years ago, and it's called Black Wednesday. Black Wednesday is meanwhile a very commonly known thing in the US and in the British um, region. And the Black Wednesday is the, is the description for the day where all the graduates from medical school and nursing school, it's a very schoolish system there. They all start on pretty much one day on the new wards. Um, after completing their their um, <coughs> their studies, and it's a uh, it's a July in the U.S. and it's uh, in uh, August in in Great Britain. They all start on the very very same day, and literature found out that on this very special day, the mortality rate among patients increases by about six percent when new trainees start to work or when junior doctors swap the wards from internal to surgeries. On the first day when they start, the mortality rate increases on this special day. And if you look at certain diseases, especially like emergency situations like heart attacks and stroke, this death rate is not increasing by 6%, but also 8%, but even 8%. And if you look into more data on how dangerous the healthcare system is, <clears throat> you will very soon fall above a study um, that was published in first time in 1999, and then a couple of um, follow-up studies on the same topic were done, describing the number of deaths in the United States because of medical errors. And in the very beginning, and even now in the end, the number is around 200, 300, 400,000 deaths per year, just because of medical errors. And this study wasn't just done by some people who needed attention or by some people who don't have good insight into the healthcare system. All these studies were published around a group from the Institute of Medicine, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and the Johns Hopkins University. They all did part of, their, of these studies, so very well known, very high reputational institutes. And these for example, in this study, 250,000 people dying just from medical errors in the United States per year. 
makes it a third leading cause of death in the United States. Frustrating high number. And the third leading cause of death in the United States as medical errors um, because of the COVID crisis these days, the COVID crisis or the COVID deaths are now the third leading cause of death in the United States. So medical errors is probably right now not the third leading cause of death, but the fourth or the fifth. And this is one of the studies where you can see who was involved in it. And there's a lot of growing issues in our system that make this problem even more complicated. The medical procedures are becoming more numerous and more complex. Medical knowledge is growing very, very fast and it's very hard to keep track on it even in your own specialty. Not to talk about other fields, you're not very heavily involved. And due to the less working hours, which is a good thing for a lot of um, healthcare providers that we're not allowed to work 100 hours per year, uh, per week anymore, due to the less working hours, the doctor's learning curves, the nurse's learning curves is um, much, more, um, much more steep and um, the learning is not as fast anymore. And the complications you see therefore are becoming more rare. So the learning is not very fast anymore. <coughs> and in addition, because of the mindset of a lot of hospitals, a lot of universities and politics is that it's pretty much getting obvious that the clinical setting is not the place to practice skills. So the question is where to practice the skills. And if you look at another thing, why medical errors are so common out there and why they love our hospitals is that in hospitals, I'm not sure how it is in Bulgaria, but this is another study um, out there. There's always chaos, there's always stress, a lot of patients coming, a lot of emergencies coming, um, not enough staffing, unclear complex processes, unclear role assignments, permanent interruptions, new cell phone calls, um, emergencies coming in, mm, spontaneous, non-standardized communications like in other industries, and little staffing, and that little staffing that you have is permanently changing, or the personnel is often underqualified. <coughs> and as a fact, it's another study from the OECD countries, medical errors are responsible for 15% of the hospital's expenditures and activities. 15% of our work in the hospital is just dedicated to treat safety failures. This is a published study from OECD countries. And this stuff, this um, amount of money in England, for example, would be the number of 3,500 nurses you could um, hire. Um, it's the same amount of money. And medicine is not very special. It's a high-risk industry, as are so many others, high-risk industries. And these findings, this literature, not just focusing on healthcare, but on safety, was used in other industries many, many years ago. So in 1903, there was the first flight by Brothers Wright. And in 1909, they started already with a flight simulator. It looks like very cheap, but it did its purpose. And pilots were trained on this before they boarded a flight because, yeah, building an airplane is very expensive and um, you don't want to trash it mm -hmm. as a youngster all the time. And due to many accidents and near misses, flight simulation is mandatory today. It's mandatory for all commercial pilots, not just in the assessment, 
but also in the continuous accreditation. And not just in Europe, but it's worldwide. And if a airliner doesn't do any simulation training in Europe, <coughs> or if an airliner doesn't do any simulation training, it won't get any permission to land its airplanes on European floors. And this is not the case for just a few years. This started almost 40 to 50 years ago. And also other industries made simulation trainings mandatory for their high-risk organizations. And this is a picture from a maritime simulator. The military found out, hey, if we want to train certain things, it's much cheaper and also much safer to let our soldiers do the first parachute um, tryouts on a simulator or let the soldiers do a parachuting exercise with heavy winds and rain into an enemy territory. It's way safer and cost effective to do it on a simulator before than actually going into a plane and burning a lot of fuel. The nuclear power plants, they train their accidents. The train industry trains. The police and military special forces, they train. And when you have a friend from the fire department, even if it's a voluntarily one, you hear them all the time saying, no, we have training. Yeah, we are on a training um, exercise. No, I cannot come because we have to trash some cars and see how we can extricate the people. And even the mountain rescue teams, they train. And as you can see in most of these pictures, they are all using high tech stuff, probably except for this one. Most of them use high tech. Why? <clears throat> it's cheaper. It's much more scalable. It's continuously available. So even at night, without having the professor um, in the teaching environment available because he's in the OR or sleeping to be um, fully recovered for, for tomorrow's surgery, the student can teach or can train himself with computer assistance, with high-tech assistance in the simulation center or at home without having the need for the professor being on site. And if certain students have a good learning curve or a very high learning curve, he probably doesn't need the training again and again. Probably for him, two hours are enough. But if you're not very talented in surgery or you're not very good in hand-eye coordination for the ultrasound, you can continuously doing the same exercise and you won't bore your professor. And we all know the more often you repeat certain stuff, it's safer, it's getting better in your brain, and finally it's helping the patient, as I will show you later in some studies. <clears throat> so I want to give you some examples of what's out there in terms of high-tech already in simulation training. And this is probably something you all know. It's a mannequin, um, not looking very realistic, screws in the arms, um, examinations you cannot really perform, but this is some of the existing stuff out there most of us know. And if you're looking at the next slide or this slide, you will see the difference. This is what is out there today, and it's not a secret picture from an R&D um, lab somewhere in Russia or um, in the US or in Japan. This is stuff that is available. This is stuff that you can buy. It's a mannequin on the right-hand side. It's a real mannequin, 3D printing of skins, uh, faces, um, and same stuff. The picture on the left, it's a pediatric simulator that's out there and I think sold a couple of thousand times already. 
moving eyes, detecting where you look at, following, um, following where the examiner goes. He can cry, he can speak, he can have blood pressure, pulses. This is stuff that is already out there in medicine. But the question is, who of us, who of you is really using it? And how often? Like the pilots or the military who are doing these trainings on a very continuous basis? Or is it like a once in a million chance that you get a spot in the sim center? This is another great tool out there addressing the problem with clinical reasoning, clinical decision making. As we all know, this is one of the big problems also resulting in the um, Black Wednesday stuff I just told you. This is a tool where you can train clinical decision making. You see a patient lying in front of you, everything high tech, everything digital. You can do examinations, x-rays, CT scans. You can talk to the patient. You can hook him up to a monitor. You can give him a medication. You can call um, your supervisor, your doctors. You can do small surgical procedures on it. And on this picture, I guess, you don't see a doctor as well because the debriefing, the feedback is given later by the computer itself. So it's looking after the algorithm that should have been followed on this very precise disease the patient has. And it looks like for the stuff that was in the algorithm and for the stuff that you've been doing. And it's showing you what was missed and what was not missed. And it's a very popular tool and a lot of universities lately buy it because in comparison to this one where you need two or three people probably for the simulation training on the trainer side, on the simulation center side, this doesn't require a teacher. And this is the picture from table in another perspective. And if you as the student, you find out that you probably did something wrong during these um, training hours, you can write down the case number or you can send yourself an email out of the system or you hook up with your own account and at home without your friends being around, you can do the same case or the same cases again on your tablet to improve your knowledge, to improve your scores and without having the stress of the others being around and probably finding out that you don't know anything about this very special disease. And if you're not happy with doing it on your tablet at home, you can also do it on the cell phone or on the laptop. And this is the learning that's not, that's, that doesn't have to be done on the ward in the hospital when the professor is ready. This is at night when you find out you cannot sleep anymore because it's putting so low, so uh, pressure on you that you couldn't identify the bleeding in this scenario. You just turn on your tablet or your laptop and start the case again. And you get the feedback from the computer and the professor is at home and sleeping as well. This is a tool where surgery can be learned from scratch. Gamification approach in the very beginning, where you learn to cut or maneuver um, with your instruments or doing um, hand-eye coordination training. And once you completed this step, once the computer defined that you are capable of doing certain things, you go to the next modules where you have to dissect arteries, do liver surgery, do cut out gallbladders, appendixes, or lung surgery. And again, as you can see on the left part of the picture, this is the simulator. And 
the simulator is there. You can train. The computer gives you feedback. And the professor doesn't have to be there all the time, but can be invited probably in the end of the day um, where he can see the videos, where he can see how your learning curve developed. And you can ask him certain questions. And you can go to this very special operation where you had the question and do this very critical step with the professor again. But all the basic groundwork is done with you as the student and the teacher without the professor. Because the professor, as we all know, is needed in the patient side, is needed in the surgery, is needed in the cath lab, and not for repetitive work with students that can be easily be taken over by high technology. This is another example for another high-tech industry, for another high-tech simulator. This is a simulator for gastroscopy, colonoscopy, bronchoscopy. You see here, I'm not a gastroenterology surgeon, but you can see here that it's going into the papilla. I think it's doing an intervention in the, in the pancreas. At least I hope it's doing it. I'm not this kind of doctor. And as a result, a lot of universities worldwide build surgical simulation centers, not just for the young doctors that have to be trained on certain appendix surgeries, but also for experienced doctors who have probably not been doing appendix surgery or lung surgery or hernia repair for quite a long time. This is also for these kind of people who want to get a quick retraining, go there at 8 o'clock in the evening or at 10 o'clock in the evening or at 7 o'clock in the morning after a night shift because the train's going at 9, so it has one more hour. And people can get retrained here. And... It's also capable, meanwhile, these kind of simulators that if you have a very complicated, let's say, renal surgery tomorrow and you don't really know how to do it, you can import your CT pictures, MRI pictures into the system. The system is calculating how this will look like in the surgery. And you can train the surgery that you have scheduled tomorrow with a real patient, you can train it already today in the simulation lab with the help of high technology. And I guess we all know that we don't need a lot of literature to support the thesis that this can really benefit the patient. Vet labs, not a very high tech thing, but still used but much more expensive than having this stuff. Virtual clinics for private care physician, Chinese products um, <coughs> available <coughs> also in other languages. It's highly repetitive, it's cheaper, the demand for rooms is lower, giving you automatic feedback out of the system and the professor um, can be available online for certain questions, but doesn't have to be there all the time. There's a big hype around virtual reality um, with the goggles you see on the left-hand side. There's more and more innovation coming from gloves um, that can especially make lives of surgeons much more easy in the in the surgery simulation perspective, because you can imagine with the controllers on the left-hand side, um, it's not very intuitive doing, doing surgeries. This is how VR simulation looks like if you're like, fully embedded in one of the simulations. And again, you can do it at 3 o'clock in the morning because you're so nervous that you have to work in the in the operation room or in the COVID station tomorrow, you can do a couple of cases of COVID patients and you get feedback from the computer. 
probably at seven in the morning, you ask the head of the department about certain things that are not obvious for you. But most of the training, again, can be done at home, highly repetitive, without the need of the professor. Ultrasound teaching. You see here a picture from thoracic, transthoracic ultrasound, this ultrasound picture on the left side, but to helping and facilitate quick learning. You have an anatomy model on the right hand side and you have a button that even can show you what structure you're looking at it right now and it puts a name on it. You probably can see the small blue dots on the on the left and right chamber and it's saying left ventricle or right ventricle. The same also available for TTE, for neck ultrasound and prenatal ultrasound, birthing ultrasounds, prenatal scannings. And ideally, all this stuff is not just freestyle learning and you in the end don't know if you've done it well or if you followed a certain protocol. For example, this, um, this module here was developed together with the American uh, intrauterine medical curriculum. Don't, I'm not 100% on the 100% sure on the on the abbreviation, but it's a um, protocol for scanning um, prenatal um, human beings. You can train angiographies for brain, for heart, for peripheral with these simulators. You can train C sections with um, simulators. So there's tons of availabilities for training also in healthcare with simulation with high-tech stuff like it is available in all other industries and i think it's now much more clear to see where the trend is going but the question is why are we in medicine still so way behind and no one's really been trained in simulation? Is it probably because there is not enough literature to support that it really benefits to the patient? No, there's wealth of evidence showing that simulation training is superior to traditional clinical education producing results that are much more powerful than reading out of um, books and that the results like we've seen before in the, in the study from the year when we landed on the moon, that the results we can achieve are not just there for two weeks in 10%, but the results is like very long lasting and stay in our memory much more precise than in all other stuff. There's tons of literature available on this topic. And it shows that simulation, other research shows that simulation is not just effective in training undergraduates, but it's also effective in training postgraduates, in faculty, and it's not just working in the life-saving business, CPR, um, anesthesia, difficult intubation, severe hypoxia. No, it's also efficient in terms of learning clinical skills, communication skills, and other stuff. And, and what's really, really cool about it is when you do simulation effectively and you, you really do a good job as simulation center, the learners, they love it. They say they want to come back. They want to come back. You see the learning curve going up, up, up. And if the teacher sees he has motivated students and they're really growing their knowledge, the teachers are motivated again. So this is sometimes helping the dilemma of the spiral of um, vice versa frustration to be eliminated. And what's up there, what I just said, is supported by tons of literature. And another literature shows that it has positive impact on the patient. It's reducing harm. 
it's improving the quality of care and it's also showing that simulation is not just a thing that's been done by a few weird enthusiasts in some small places around the world. No, this literature also shows that it's a very profound constituent, a very central constituent of the healthcare education of it. So it's probably the reason why simulation is not more common that simulation is so new um, that no one medical simulation really heard of it. No, unfortunately not, or fortunately not. This is a picture from the first simulator we in Europe know of. It was developed, for those of you who still can see it, <coughs> it's developed like 250 years ago by a midwife in France. And this simulator, if you compare it to a couple of other simulators out there in the healthcare industry, um, yeah, I mean, probably it's not running with power and it probably is not bleeding, but actually it's doing a lot of things pretty much the same way as in modern simulators. And if you look at worldwide, why where simulation really appeared for the first time, it's Europe. And right now, if you compare Europe to Asia, US, Europe is way behind the development of simulation, um, at least in terms of number of simulators used and number of students being trained in simulation. We lost a lot of this, um, a lot of this spirits quite a while ago. There's some positive examples and um, I'll stop in a minute. Um, there's some positive examples like the one from the SAGES, the Society of American Gastroenterologic uh, Surgeons and also from American Heart Association, ATLS, that's showing that it really has a lot of positive impact. And what they're doing is before sending the students into the endoscopy lab, they have them trained in the simulation lab. And when they did a couple of cases there, they can go to the simulation lab. And they also do the birth certification on a simulator. Coming to the end, I don't want to give you the negative impression that we in Europe are way behind and simulation is not really used. I want to give you a more optimistic end. In 1999 in JAMA, there was this very first um, study on, on patient safety and to err as human. And to err as human is not a very good end, um, I have to admit. I want to end with a very cool saying by a person, Tony Kern, and he's saying to improve is human, to grow is human, and to learn is human. Thank you for your attention. Ready to take your questions. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Lucas. Your talks are always inspirational. So the floor is open to questions now. So our attendees are very shy. <laughs> okay, so there will be- There's uh, a question. Uh, if there are questions in the, the chat. chat. There's can, a question in the chat, yeah. Yeah, you can answer them too. 